Hello and welcome to the third and final module of this course on community rights and forest governance. In the previous module, we learned about the various legal provisions that govern forested landscapes in India. You also arrive at this module with an understanding of the social, economic, ecological, political and historical context in which these laws operate. Now it is time to understand how your knowledge can be put to use. In this module, you will learn how communities can use these laws and procedures to participate in the governance of forests. We've already learned that the decisions to use forests for different purposes need to be taken after following different legal procedures. The diversion of forest land to build a mine requires a different legal procedure from the one required to establish a wildlife sanctuary, which in turn is different from the one required to manage the forest for the production of timber or other forest produce. In this lecture, we will revise our understanding of these processes, but this time we will pay special attention to the various spaces for communities living in and on the fringes of forests to participate in these procedures. To start with, let's go through the procedures to divert forest land for non-forest purposes. Forest land, as we have learned in the previous module of this course, can only be used for a so-called non-forest purpose with the permission of the state government and the Ministry of Environment and Forests. This includes forests of all types and not merely any particular legal class of forest. This means that any time forest land has to be used for a mine or a coffee plantation or a dam, to pick just a few examples of such non-forest purposes, it needs to go through the three-stage procedure laid out in the rules made under the Forest Conservation Act. So I think diversion and acquisition are, uh, are processes that are very clearly looking to change what is happening in a place. So there is already a set of activities taking place. It could be a completely greenfield area where there has been no uh, infrastructure or extractive projects in the past. Or it could be a brownfield area where there have been several projects in, uh, uh, you know, ongoing and, you're look and projects are looking for expansion. So I think in either each of these cases, uh, these processes which, which have laid out certain uh, procedures uh, in the law start off very differently on the ground. I mean, for instance, a greenfield place where people don't have a knowledge of uh, what is, you know, what is really coming up, often it would start with somebody coming in and collecting samples. And you would not know why a drilling machine has, is, uh, is coming in. Uh, if you ask, you will be often told, who are you to ask? We've got permissions. If a paper is shown, you will not know really what is written on the paper and how is it linked to a law for acquisition or a law for diversion. So I think some of those basic questions need to be addressed when, uh, you know, uh, when, when these processes are initiated in a, in a space. And often when it comes to scoping exercises, uh, there is absolutely no obligation that the private sector or the government uh, projects have to really share. You know, the, the local panchayats can definitely ask. Uh, they do ask, but often it's brushed aside because they say the uh, you know the collector would be there or saying that a very very cursorily uh, it would be responded to. So in both these processes, this is one of the first thing that happens. For any diversion of forest land for a so-called non-forest purpose, the procedure set out under the rules made under the Forest Conservation Act requires the district collector of the affected area to ensure that the recognition and vesting of rights under the Forest Rights Act has been completed in that area. We have already learned in the last module about how the process of recognition and vesting must be done. The district collector also has to obtain the written consent of the Gram Sabha that has jurisdiction over that area for the proposal and any measures to ameliorate or compensate for the damage that would be caused to the forest. This is the space that the law provides the Gram Sabha of an affected area to influence decisions about diverting forests for non-forest purposes. This must happen during the first stage of the procedure set out in the rules made under the Forest Conservation Act. Now, post the Forest Rights Act uh, 2006, there has been a, you know, a strong tool available for communities to hold companies accountable. And the provisions that enable that are twofold. One is the rights recognition process itself, because there was an order by the Ministry of Environment and Forests in 2009, where it said that for forest clearance to be granted, we have to ensure that the rights uh, recognition process is complete. And second, that consent is obtained from the Gram Sabha. 
Um, so those are two really strong tools that the community can use to resist um, against companies. Remember, so far we have only discussed the procedure for diversion. That is, a decision taken to use forest land for a so-called non-forest purpose. When it comes to forest land, the state is the custodian of forests. For that reason, there is no question of acquisition of forest land. Forest land is merely diverted from use for forestry purposes to a non-forest purpose. But some projects can involve the acquisition of land that is not forest land, for example, revenue land. The procedures for acquisition also contain spaces for local communities to exert their influence, especially in scheduled areas. One of them is under the PESA law. If the area that will be affected by a project falls within one of the scheduled areas, then the Gram Sabha also needs to be consulted under the PESA for the acquisition of any land for development projects. Let's pause to briefly consider the meaning of consent under the rules made under the Forest Conservation Act and consultation under the PESA law. Consent means that the project cannot receive in principle approval in the first stage of the diversion process without the permission of the Gram Sabha. If a Gram Sabha refuses to approve the diversion of forest land for any non forest purpose, then that diversion cannot go ahead. Consent should also be free and informed. This means that the Gram Sabha should make its decision on whether the forest land should be diverted only when presented with the full facts of the diversion. The Gram Sabha should know about the potential for ecological damage, the potential for economic and social development, and all the other facts and projections that it needs to consider to make a fully informed decision. The decision must also be free of any coercion. There should be no threats or any kind of corrupt incentive. Under the PESA law, on the other hand, the permission of the Gram Sabha is not a necessary condition for the acquisition of land in a scheduled area. Consultation, however, requires that the Gram Sabha should be provided with all the information about the project. The requirement under the right to fair compensation and transparency in land acquisition, rehabilitation and resettlement act 2013 is even stricter than the requirement under the PESA law. Under that law, the prior consent of the Gram Sabha or Panchayat or Autonomous District Council in cases where the Gram Sabha has not been constituted must be obtained in all cases of land acquisition in scheduled areas. It also requires that the land should only be acquired as a last resort. Therefore, prior to an acquisition of land in a scheduled area, the Gram Sabha of that area has the space to not give its consent for that acquisition. At that stage, the government should also be able to demonstrate that no other land, particularly land that is not part of any scheduled area, was available for the same purpose. Further, under the PESA law, no prospecting license, mining lease or concession for the exploitation of minor minerals can be granted in scheduled areas without the recommendation of the Gram Sabha or Panchayats at the appropriate level. So under all three laws, that is, the rules made under the Forest Conservation Act, under the PESA law, and the right to compensation and transparency in land acquisition law, forest dwelling communities have, through their Gram Sabhas, the space to influence decisions regarding the use of forests for non-forest purposes. Now here you should remember a confusion in the law that we referred to in the previous module. We learnt that under the PESA law, the Gram Sabha has to be consulted before there is any developmental activity in a scheduled area. However, the words of the law are actually Gram Sabha or the Panchayat at the appropriate level. Several state governments have taken a restrictive view of this provision and require consultation only at the Panchayat or the Zilla level. This goes contrary to the purpose behind the PESA law. The Hasdeo Arant coal field, which is a part of North Chhattisgarh, where I am working these days, is a good example. Mining projects are coming up in this area on a big scale, and the way communities are using both these laws has been remarkable. Whenever a project is conceived, especially if it is being planned to be set up in Schedule 5 areas, consultation with and the consent of Gram Sabha has to be obtained before acquiring land for the project as per the PESA law of 1996. Gram Sabhas are exercising their rights in the Hasdeo area and are clearly saying that we do not want such mining projects. They say that the fifth schedule to the constitution and the PESA law 
gives us this right and our Gram Sabha has not agreed to this project. PESA can definitely be used in this manner. I would like to mention a confusion created in Chhattisgarh. It is being said that under the Coal Bearing Act, the consent of the Gram Sabha is not required. This is a very wrong interpretation of the law. The Coal Bearing Act was enacted in 1956 when there was no provision for Gram Sabha consent under any law. It was only with the PESA in 1996 that the consent of the Gram Sabha became mandatory for land acquisition and also applicable to other central laws. If we look at the Land Acquisition Act of 2013, Section 41 specifically mentions that for land acquisition or alienation in scheduled areas under that law or any other central as well as state law, the consent of the Gram Sabha is mandatory. Here we should remember what we learnt about the meaning of consent under the rules made under the Forest Conservation Act and the meaning of consultation under the PESA law. These are two different words that have been used in these laws and we should understand that what the law requires from these two terms are also different. I feel that all these explanations are wrong. In scheduled areas under the fifth schedule to the constitution and under PESA and the Land Acquisition Act, land cannot be acquired without consulting or seeking consent from the Gram Sabha. This is a big safeguard and Gram Sabhas of Hansdeo are using these laws and putting forward their struggles successfully. If we talk about the Forest Rights Act of 2006, it recognizes the historic injustice meted out to tribals and tries to undo it. This act also ensures that the rights that they already have are safeguarded. There is a process to divert forest land for projects to be set up. Without changing the purpose of land from forest to non-forest, forest land cannot be diverted. This is called the process of diversion. Before the enactment of Forest Rights Act, the diversion process was very simple. It was carried out by the forest department and approval was given by regional or central ministry in charge of these forests. The Forest Rights Act modified the diversion process. As per the act, when the nodal officer proceeds with the proposal of forest land diversion, the district collector is expected to complete the process of forest rights recognition and seek consent from the Gram Sabha. The act categorically says that only the Gram Sabha can declare that the process of forest rights recognition is complete. No other officer has the authority to declare it. I would like to quote Niyamgiri as an example. When the case of Vedanta's bauxite mine came up, the Supreme Court ruled that Gram Sabha will be the final authority. Before diversion of forest land, consent from Gram Sabhas had to be sought. Gram Sabhas said that they did not want mining to happen and Vedanta had to withdraw. Paragraph 60 of the Supreme Court's judgment is worth reading in full. We are therefore inclined to give a direction to the state of Orissa to place these issues before the Gram Sabha with notice to the Ministry of Tribal Affairs Government of India. And the Gram Sabha would take a decision on them within three months and communicate the same to the MOAF through the state government. On the conclusion of the proceeding before the Gram Sabha determining the claim submitted before it, the MOEF shall take a final decision on the grant of stage 2 clearance for the bauxite mining project, in light of the decisions of the Gram Sabha within two months thereafter. If I could just give you a little bit about the facts about that case, because it's a very interesting story. Um, the Dongaria cones are a, a particularly vulnerable tribal group. It's a very, very small tribal group in uh, Orissa. Uh, com I think the total population is around 8,000 people only. They uh, live in a very remote part of uh, Kalahandi and some parts of Raigada district. Uh, and they are very shy, very uh, 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 you know reclusive community. And uh, there is a, 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 a hill area called the Niyamgiri Hills, uh, which is considered sacred by this particular uh, tribal community and a, a very, very ancient traditional practices relating to this particular hill as a result of which there is no uh, kind of uh, inhabitation or or nobody in fact uh, even collects minor forest produce or or does grazing in those that particular hill because that community considers the niyam raja which is the 
main hill in that area to be their god so as we know uh, tribal communities are animistic in their spiritual beliefs so they believe uh, they, they worship all the, the all kinds of uh, you know uh, natural uh, um, entities uh, this particular community believes that the hill itself is uh, their god and they uh, have a obviously uh, enormous relationship of love affection protection towards that god and they believe that that that, that god protects them now what was discovered uh, by the indian state uh, was that this particular hill has very very important and large resources of bauxite and uh, through a process of uh, uh, through the uh, whatever approvals and so on the mining lease for this uh, particular hill area was granted to a uh, 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 public sector corporation called Orissa Mining Corporation, which in turn engaged a multinational corporation called Vedanta to mine that particular area. Now, the, the local communities, the in, environmental groups, the forest dwelling communities and a, a lot of civil society uh, persons challenged this um, uh, project at various, various levels. The interesting thing is that uh, although th there is a large body of environmental and forest laws which ought to have protected this land, uh, all those uh, uh, challenges uh, continued to fail over the years. Uh, very interestingly, some of my friends were involved in that litigation and it was interesting to see how uh, every step of the way they would just keep losing and not giving up. That's also a very important thing to learn from this case. Uh, but eventually when the uh, matter came up in the Supreme Court and the issue of the Forest Rights Act was brought up. Uh, this argument somehow resonated with the court and uh, after hearing detailed arguments including from the Solicitor General for India and a wide array of senior advocates representing the corporations, the state government and also of course the tri tribal group. Um, and civil society uh, the supreme court passed a three judges bench decision which has actually become a, a benchmark for the forest rights act and also for the uh, 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 law around adivasi rights in india in short what the court said was after examining the entire constitutional and statutory framework around adivasi rights and forest rights in india including the history of the Forest Rights Act and how it came into being, the court came to this conclusion that without consulting the Gram Sabha of forest dwellers, forest clearance cannot be granted by the central government for a particular forest that is traditionally that villages. Now, the very interesting part of this case is that at that point of time, those uh, primitive tribal group called the Dongaria Kons had actually not filed their claims under the Forest Rights Act yet. But because it was well known and well understood that they have existing rights which are ancient rights over that lands, those lands, the Supreme Court actually directed the uh, central government and the state government to go back to that Gram Sabha, those Gram Sabhas and ask them and they, this, that the decision making regarding the forest clearance finally rests with that Gram Sabha. Uh, after that judgment was passed, this was I think in uh, April 2013. Uh, subsequently over the next few months, the state government did go. Uh, that's another story. It's an interesting story another day. Uh, and, and consulted all those, uh, there were 12 Gram Sabhas in the picture. Uh, unanimously, every single Gram Sabha uh, made their verdict absolutely clear. They did not want the project. They wanted to protect the Niamgiri hills. They wanted to protect the Niam Raja. And they said a resounding no to the project. Subsequently, the both the Orissa Mining Corporation as well as the Vedanta Company came back to the Supreme Court asking for modifications of the order. Again, these uh, applications were rejected by the court. 
what's very important to remember about the orissa mining corporation case is that it could have very easily fallen into the trap of becoming a case that relates only to the facts of that particular case and uh, then remain restricted to providing relief to those 12 villages of the dungaria coons but what i find very interesting about the niamgiri case is that after the judgment was passed immediately within one month in fact the case was cited by the gujarat high court in a very important judgment that the gujarat high court gave, gave relating to the forest rights act and it has been picked up by different high courts different uh, uh, tribunals different district courts sometimes even magistrates courts all over the country and it has been used again and again the legal principle established by the supreme court that a uh, a uh, a gram sabha of forest dwellers needs to be the one that decides how development happens in their forest that legal principle has been picked up and has been applied over and over in many different kinds of fact situations and in fact in situations where different very different laws are applicable for instance there is one uh, judgment which uh, um, a more recent judgment where the uh, niamgiri principle has been applied to an environmental clearance so uh, uh, and the niamgiri case was about forest clearances so this is a very interesting case i find the uh, the developments that have taken place subsequent to the niamgiri judgment actually to be even more interesting because uh, now uh, because of wide publicity uh, the niamgiri judgment is well known in all the tribal areas of the country and uh, i don't think that the supreme court when they were passing this judgment realized that the tribal community was going to really pick this up and run with it the way that they have so section 4 subsection 5 says that the process of recognition has to be completed first an order dated july 4 2009 issued during the tenure of jairam ramesh is very important the order specifically mentions that process of forest rights recognition has to be completed before any forest land diversion and that the consent of the gram sabha is mandatory This is a very important provision but because of a lack of awareness in areas like Chhattisgarh land acquisition has happened illegally you will not find any village where process of rights recognition has been completed it is either pending at individual rights or community rights or community resource rights i strongly feel that this act should be used properly gram sabhas of hansdeo have used this provision remarkably and several times have registered their protest against diversions saying that rights recognition is pending in our villages and our gram sabhas have not agreed to this diversion here i want to add one more thing the ministry of environment and forests has amended the process and said that the process of rights recognition should be completed before the second stage of approval i believe however that it should be completed before the first stage itself because once a company invests a large sum of money then it has a greater chance to influence the process regardless of that if rec- if rights recognition is not completed then the second stage processes will not progress this is the importance of this act let's also now consider the nature of the decision that the gram sabha has to make under each of these laws in the rules made under the forest conservation act The Gram Sabha is exercising its statutory powers of governance over the forest land in question. These powers of governance emerge out of the Forest Rights Act, under which the Gram Sabha has a right to influence what happens to that land. It is being asked to consider whether the purpose for which the land is proposed to be diverted is a fit purpose, and then decide whether it wants to consent to that diversion. Its role under the PESA law and under the land acquisition law is different. it has to consider whether the resettlement and rehabilitation package offered it wants to consent to the acquisition of rights now even though the procedure set out under these laws may be clear a community living in or on the fringes of forests may experience the legal process of diversion of forest land in a variety of ways one of our experts will now explain why depending on the facts of the project's plan for the forest land it is important to see these legal procedures from two separate viewpoints first from the viewpoint of an expansion to an ongoing project known as brownfield projects 
In a brownfield area, activities are usually very different because uh, often land acquisition and diversion per per uh, permissions might have been taken in the past, uh, say three years back or 10 years back or 15 years back. And uh, for some economic or other reason, uh, the activity has not started or say there's been a government change, the activity has not started. And suddenly you'll find a group of uh, laborers and contractors reaching a point, fencing out the area, um, asking you to be moved from that area. And then you would wonder why this has happened, either because you don't have the paperwork for it or the, you thought the paperwork you have has lapsed because you've, you've just been in that area. So I think these are the, you know, these are the kinds of activities that happen when there are expansion projects or an, a new project in an already in, you know, area. Now, in such cases, people are often aware of what could be the impacts, but there to the complete clarity of uh, what is this uh, you know what is what is this activity all about? Is it for transportation? Is it for actual new extraction? Those things are often not uh, uh, shared. Uh, the the response you would get is we've actually issued a notice in the newspapers, uh, which is what is uh, required by law, or you know the records are available uh, with the district panchayat office or the collector's office, and you would want to then dig up records post facto uh, in in some of these areas. So these kinds of issues definitely come up. In a greenfield area where uh, where uh, none of this has happened uh, before, the biggest confusion would be when a Gram Sabha meeting is called. Now, you would probably have a Gram Sabha meeting for at least three laws, which might or might not directly be linked. You might not perceive it as being linked to uh, uh, forest. So, for instance, a Gram Sabha meeting will be called and Gram Sabha consent is required at least for three laws uh, under the Panchayat Extension for Scheduled Areas Act, uh, there is uh, under the land acquisition process as well as under the Forest Rights Act for forest diversions and, and rights recognition. Uh, the, those two are separate. So they, you often don't know that the Grand, Gram Sabha meeting is being called. What is it for? And documents would indicate that the Gram Sabha has been called once and uh, with or without quorum, decisions on all these processes have been taken in one shot. Whereas each one of these would require deliberation of a different kind. It would require uh, presentation of facts of a different kind because acquisition means something else. Uh, you know, rights recognition is trying to look at claims. Forest diversion would, you need to put a set, set of facts of ecological and uh, uh, all kinds of impacts and livelihood uses under a different law. But they all get merged. So actually really looking out for what is that process going to be, that clarity and obviously, that clarity often doesn't come up in the Gram Sabha meeting because giving that clarity means deliberation. Deliberation means time. And, uh, you know, the general narrative is that if you give time, projects never get approved. So these are two important decisions that Gram Sabhas have to take in the context of any diversion of forest land for non-forest purposes. Let's now learn from the experience of one of our experts. Jainandan Singh Porte is associated with a movement that organized several villages in Sirguja district in Chhattisgarh to claim their community forest rights under the Forest Rights Act. In 2016, after those rights had been recognized, the Chhattisgarh government announced that it had cancelled the forest rights allotted to tribals of Ghadbara village in Surguja district. The district level committee cancelled our rights, saying that the land had been allocated for mining much before our forest rights were recognized. The point to be noted is that besides taking consent from the Gram Sabha for land acquisition under PESA, the Forest Rights Act also under Section 4, Clause 5 states that no villager can be removed from forest land under their occupation till their forest rights recognition and verification procedure is completed. As a matter of fact, the claim forms for individual forest rights are still being submitted and the community rights are also incomplete. Moreover, Resource rights are yet not recognized. In a nutshell, the Forest Rights Act procedure has not been completed, but the land has been allocated for mining. This is illegal. The Pasa coal block is another mine. People learn from the Pasa Kente mines that no benefit comes to communities after allowing these mines. So through Gram Sabhas, people used to protest against Pasa coal mines. The administration called Sarpanch Sachiv to the rest house and completed the process. In a way, companies are ruling Sarbuja and the government had sidelined people's rights completely. 
in a way companies are ruling sarguja and the government has sidelined people's rights completely if we look at the hans if we look at the hans tio area which falls under the koba district it has dense forests that are natural with very diverse tree specifics i feel that nowhere else in the country could there be such diverse dense and natural vegetation it also has various kinds of herbs and medicinal plants it is an elephant habitat also has tigers bears deer etc considering all these facts we are facing this battle to save hans tier aran with the help of the forest rights act we have gone there to save these forests i want to believe that public hearing for the coal blocks are located in the korba and paturia girmundi should happen sometime soon the government should also come forward to save this precious forest we are already in the fight and villages too are in their struggles to save their traditional nishta rights the mines will create an existential crisis for the villagers people have learned enough from pasta kente and do not want mines to come in these areas so that was an example of how a community used its rights under the forest rights act to influence a decision on diverting forest lands for a non forest purpose such as mining let's quickly recap the powers of the gram sabha in relation to the diversion of forest land firstly diversion can only happen after the process of recognition of rights under the forest rights act is complete you will recall that the gram sabha has a central role in this process secondly forest land cannot be diverted for a non forest purpose without following the procedure set out under the rules made under the forest conservation act under those rules documenting the consent of the gram sabha to the diversion is an essential step the forest clearance process does not uh, give any mandatory space for communities to participate in the decision making on forest diversions except when there is an interface with the forest uh, rights act but uh, in terms of the forest uh, forest clearance process what you could could do is uh, uh, you know really start uh, ahead and try and find out at the and this divisional forest officers or office whether there are, there have been any applications for forest diversions if you just get an inkling from the newspapers or you see any activity of any uh, company moving around or any uh, consultants moving around you could go and find out whether there has been any formal application to for felling of trees or diverting forest land and uh, if yes uh, try and ask for the status uh, and uh, site inspection reports both of which if it's a good uh, forest officer they might give it to you as is or through the right to information process you could get access to those um, those those reports subsequently the entire process will need to be followed up uh, all the way to the uh, to the uh, to the principal chief conservator of the forest because at every stage this uh, site inspection or by the dfo and the, all the papers submitted at the time of uh, uh, the, the forest diversion would move uh in the in the, you know in the in the forest department prior to them having been able to send this uh uh the the application to the ministry of environment regional office or central office for approval remember that at each stage of the forest diversion process the in principle approval that is the approvals provided at each stage before a final approval under the forest conservation act always come with a set of conditions Compliance with these conditions is a necessary part of the procedure for receiving a final approval. These conditions provide another opportunity for communities to intervene in the process of diversion of forest land. Always remember that the forest diversion process at least has three steps of approvals. The first step would be an in principle or stage 1 approval by the by the Ministry of Environment's regional office or the central office depending on how big the forest land um, is involved in the, in the process uh, at that point of time a stage 1 forest clearance process always comes with a set of conditions these conditions could be extremely substantive in nature including things like wildlife management plan assessment of uh, uh, tribal populations uh, impacts on water resources there are extremely substantive studies which will be important which often are undertaken afresh uh, and these studies are not available to ascertain the impacts on uh, on 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 forest diversion so it's important to track those studies it will be all these will be listed 
listed as part of the uh, sometimes even the designated institutions are listed as part of forest uh, stage one forest clearance. Once that's done, uh, the applicant as well as the state government actually submits a compliance report along with the uh, you know all the studies etc. Seeking stage two forest clearance, and that stage two forest clearance is subject to the whole list of compliances and how well uh, those studies are. All of them have to be assessed by the forest advisory committee prior to giving a stage two clearance. Uh, so at, even at that point of time, at the point when forest stage one is being approved, uh, at the point where stage two is being approved, you have the opportunity to be able to intervene, uh, to be able to give substantive comments, both in terms of why some of those studies should have been done prior to stage one, why uh, there is, it's important to involve communities who are going to be affected by the project in actually drafting and crafting some of those studies. It's not enough for expert institutions to come in and uh, you know uh, do the studies and, and move out in the area. These are opportunities to demand that uh, these, these, the methodologies uh, through which these studies are done are, are far more open, participatory, transparent, and all the uh, you know all the problems that we've had in, as part of the stage one approval are actually amended when we are before the first stage two studies are uh, complete. In case stage two uh, approval also comes through, uh, at that point of time, uh, no forest diversion comes into effect uh, unless and until the state government gives uh, a final order under section two of the Forest Conservation Act, and if. Even before, uh, if you're not satisfied with uh, the stage two approval by the Ministry of Environment Forest, there's always a space to intervene with the state governments and say why you're not satisfied. Uh, you know, uh, this, the, it, it is important to actually raise why you're not satisfied with the Ministry of Environment Forest. Uh, they might reconsider the decision or not, but there is always a legal space that you could exercise that the state government has not given the final approval for this diversion. At that point of time, it is important, even if the law does not specifically uh, prescribe a grievance process, you could use that interim period with, between uh, stage two clearance and the final approval by the forest uh, by the state forest department or the state government to actually raise all the grievances or reiterate all the grievances that you've done so far. And this has been done uh, in several instance, instances by uh, community-based organizations. Uh, Thirdly. For the acquisition of land in a scheduled area, consultation with the Gram Sabha is an essential step under the PESA law. Further, the acquisition of land in a scheduled area cannot proceed without the consent of the Gram Sabha under the land acquisition law. We've learned how communities can participate in decisions to use forests for non-forest purposes. Now let's look at decisions to use forests for conservation. The Wildlife Protection Act sets out the procedure by which state and central governments can declare areas to be wildlife sanctuaries, national parks, tiger reserves, community reserves, conservation reserves, and critical tiger habitats. Under the Forest Rights Act, there is another procedure to declare an area as a critical wildlife habitat. We have already been introduced to these procedures. You know, there is some news or, uh, you know, somebody has actually formally come and told you that this area is going to be declared uh, protected for wildlife under the Wildlife Protection Act. Uh, in a situation like this, there could be at least four or five different scenarios that might be in front of you. Uh, you need to first know what is the kind of protected area that is getting declared. Uh, the Wildlife Protection Act it provides for at least four kinds of areas. You could also need, you would also need to know whether this is actually being done under the Wildlife Protection Act or is it being done under the Forest Rights Act, which has a provision of uh, the critical wildlife habitats? So really, for the first step is to find out if anybody, anybody, any newspaper or any government official or just somebody that gives you a tip off to find out that this area is being declared, uh, you know, protected for wildlife. What is that kind of, uh, you know, protected area option that is being proposed? Let us remind ourselves about the legal characteristics of the different types of protected areas. A protected area under the Wildlife Protection Act is a piece of land where land use is restricted. Depending on how strict the restrictions are, that is, the kinds of human activity that are prohibited on that land, such protected areas may be of a few different types. National parks and tiger reserves are the most strictly protected. Virtually no human activity is allowed in these areas except activity in the interests of wildlife conservation.
in wildlife sanctuaries, which is another category of protected area, grazing and some types of private property rights may be allowed at the discretion of the chief wildlife warden of that area. The commercial exploitation of forest produce is completely prohibited in national parks, tiger reserves, and wildlife sanctuaries. Local communities can collect forest produce only for their bona fide needs. Community reserves and conservation reserves are two other categories of protected areas where local communities have a greater role in conservation. Critical tiger habitats are areas where, in the opinion of the state government, human activity could not coexist with the tiger population. The management of tiger reserves had to be in accordance with a tiger conservation plan prepared by the state government. Critical wildlife habitats under the Forest Rights Act are areas that in the opinion of the central government formed on the basis of scientific and objective criteria need to be kept inviolate for the purpose of wildlife conservation. So these are the different legal categories of areas that are protected for the purpose of wildlife conservation. It is important to understand these categories because human activities are restricted in these areas to different extents. They are most restricted in national parks, critical tiger habitats and critical wildlife habitats. They are restricted to lesser extents in wildlife sanctuaries depending on what the wildlife department permits. And in community reserves and conservation reserves, the local communities are part of the conservation efforts. The third aspect of any of these protected area options is that how much community part participation can be there in, um, in conservation activities. So first ascertaining what kind of um, you know, uh, protected area option is there. Next understanding can you play a role in conservation activities and what kind of rights are getting protected. Number three based on both of these really figuring out and having understanding at the village level do you really want to do that. Uh, the option of uh, whether some communities would, would talk about with all information um, before you what are the pros and cons of relocation, what are the pros and cons of staying here, uh, what, are, what are the pros and cons of actually proactively engaging in conservation activities, what are the pros and, pros and cons of uh, not engaging with it. Having all the information with you and sitting down and having a, a discussion which of is an ideal situation but even a group if even if it's a group of people uh, in a community who could who could do that to figure out what your options are and what options would you like to exercise? Uh, uh, what are your options in, in the law? Uh, what are the options you would like to exercise? Uh, putting that uh, in front of you and discussing it and then engaging with the government about it. Now, if you take, for example, a situation where an area is being declared a national park, uh, up front you would know that your uh, rights are going to be extinguished. At that point of time, the option needs to be in front of you whether you want to stay or you want to actually leave. Uh, obviously, after the declaration of a national park, your options really get curtailed. If you decide that you do not want to contest the declaration of the, of the national park, then you want, the next step is, okay, is everybody who is dependent on that forest, have their uh, existing rights really been taken into account for the settlement of rights process? That bureaucratic paperwork uh, needs to be brought forward. There was a case in uh, Himachal Pradesh where uh, some colonial records were used. Uh, to really ascertain uh, whose rights are uh, who, who actually whose rights need to be settled under the Wildlife Protection Act, and that raised huge kinds of problems because many people were actually out of that settlement of rights process, even if they wanted to be part of it. So I think really figuring out what what government records are going to be used to be to be able to ascertain that, uh, and I think finding out at what stage you want to uh, engage with it. So that entire you know stream of knowledge. Uh, based on the options you'd like to exercise or entire, having the entire stream of knowledge to figure out what option you want to recognize would, would be very important when it comes to creating a conservation area. Uh, in a, in a, in a, you, know, you could even argue that I want to be, uh, be we're talking about a uh, community reserve area or a conservation reserve area where you present it as an option that I want to be part of that much more proactively uh, process. So these are all negotiated outcomes if once you once you get to know. Obviously, in the political economy of how these things happen, it's not as simple and straightforward. That is why, you know, you know being empowered with the knowledge about what the law says, uh, being empowered with the knowledge about uh, what my rights are and how much I can push my options are very critical for, uh, for communities to figure out. As we have learned already, because of the Forest Rights Act, forest-dwelling people can exercise their rights even within national parks, 
wildlife sanctuaries, critical tiger habitats, and in other kinds of protected areas. However, the laws and procedures related to the creation of inviolate spaces for conservation in forests, such as under the Wildlife Protection Act and the Indian Forest Act, have conflicted with the exercise of these rights. Some of the most important tools for forest dwelling communities to resolve these conflicts are the safeguards built into the process of relocating them from these areas. Some avenues for participation are also built into the process for determining the need for and the limits of these inviolate spaces. We will learn them later in this module. Before declaring an area other than a reserve forest as a wildlife sanctuary or as a national park, the law requires the government to first establish the rights of people in or over that area. This means that the process of recognition of rights under the Forest Rights Act has to be complete. The Gram Sabha, as you know, has a central role in that process. Once that has been completed, the state government needs to undertake the process of acquisition of rights under the Wildlife Protection Act. Similarly, the declaration of an area within a national park or a wildlife sanctuary as a critical wildlife habitat under the Forest Rights Act or a critical tiger reserve under the Wildlife Protection Act can only follow the recording of the rights of forest dwellers in the area. But in these two cases, a few additional steps need to be followed and one of them involves the Gram Sabha. Before establishing a critical wildlife habitat, the state government has to obtain the free informed consent of the Gram Sabhas of the area in question to the proposed resettlement package for the forest dwellers who will be resettled from the area. Before establishing a critical tiger habitat, the state government has to obtain the consent of the scheduled tribes and other forest dwellers of the area regarding two things. Firstly, that the activities of those people are sufficient to cause irreversible damage and threaten the existence of tigers in their habitat. And secondly, that no coexistence options are available. So these are the spaces for local communities and forest dwellers to participate in the decision to use forest land for conservation. And with that, we have come to the end of this lecture on how local communities can participate in decisions to use forests for various purposes. In all cases, the process of recognition of rights under the Forest Rights Act must be completed before any of these decisions are taken. And as you know, the Gram Sabha has a central role in that process. We also learnt about the rights of the Gram Sabha under the Forest Conservation Act to participate in the process of diversion of forest land. We also learnt about the powers of the Gram Sabha in relation to the acquisition of land in scheduled areas under the PESA law and under the land acquisition law. We learnt about how a critical tiger habitat can be declared only after forest dwellers have consented that their activities can cause irreversible damage to the tiger habitat and how critical wildlife habitat can be declared only after the Gram Sabha has consented to the resettlement package. Now, apart from participating in these processes through the Gram Sabha, local communities can also take steps to ensure that the other parts of the process, that is, the parts of the process that do not involve the Gram Sabha, also meet the standards expected of them under the law. For that, it is important, whether it is a diversion of forest land or a decision to establish a conservation space, to have an understanding of all the steps in these processes. You can get a good understanding of these processes and a checklist of standards that these processes must meet in the reading materials that accompany this module. We will now move on to how communities can participate in the governance of what follows from decisions to use forests for specific purposes. We will start with the management of forests in the next lecture. Thanks for watching.